problem with. Uh, we have been having internet problems in the office this morning. Uh, they seem to be mostly resolved, but obviously if at any point I drop off or you can't hear me, uh, do just holler or throw something up in chat and I'll pause. Uh, but equally, if as happened before, I know on some presentations if I fall out of sync with myself, then uh, let me know and then I should be good to uh, jump back on. So I'll do a bit of a, an introduction myself. You can see our lovely uh, front page. I work for Web Anywhere as the delivery team leader for the secondary and international division, uh, which is quite a mouthful. And uh, believe you me, I do struggle a little bit with business cards on that one. Uh, generally, what my team does is build, develop, and deliver uh, Moodles for secondary schools in the UK and around the world. So it's not too complicated, and the job title makes a bit more sense when you know that. Uh, I'll just give you a bit of background about who I am and kind of where I've come from. Uh, my contact details on that slide, so either if you're looking now or if you're looking at some point in the future, looking into the deep and distant past that is us, then uh, you can always drop me an email, my work email address is ben.vargnotwebanywhere.co.uk and you can tweet to me as my work Twitter, which is at School Anywhere, which is our kind of Moodle related brand. So if you want to get hold of me on Twitter most days, I uh, should probably be doing more work and less tweeting, but that's another issue. Uh, so I am on there and if anyone wants to follow me or tweet me you're more than welcome to either just to say hi or if you've got any questions about anything. Now in terms of my general background uh, you're going to hear a lot about all of this because obviously being a journey is quite personal. I started my career in IT working in general IT for the government in the UK. Uh, mostly kind of desktop computing, printers, hardware, that sort of thing. And whilst I was doing that, I began to get an interest in web design. So I started learning a bit more about web development, doing some basic sites in kind of HTML and that sort of thing. Uh, and then as time developed there, I started learning a bit more about Joomla. And uh, I'm sure many of you have used Joomla before, but that was the kind of the first CMS I cut my teeth on. So I started developing in Joomla. And because of my Joomla experience, I moved to work for an e-learning charity based in Yorkshire and was mostly dealing with again their hardware and their Joomla websites and whilst I was there I got kind of interested in e-learning and we worked very closely with a local college who used Moodle so that's why I was introduced to Moodle you have to excuse me as I take uh, swigs of drink it's a bit hot here in the UK so uh, suffering slightly in a stuffy little meeting room but uh, yeah after I got kind of a, a feel for Moodle I thought oh, this is quite good this and so I'd want to get more interested in it so I transferred to work for a secondary school, also in Yorkshire, and I took over all their Joomla websites and their Moodle. And when I started there, they had a Moodle 1.9.7. I think at that point Moodle was on about 0.15 and they just haven't updated it in a very long time. And uh, when I began, we had basically the IT department on it in a heavy way, and science had some SCORM content, and that was about it. So uh, my goal while I was there was to try to get absolutely everyone online and uh, for those of you that work with schools or in schools uh, my crowning achievement was I got the RE department the religious studies department online on the Moodle using it regularly so uh, although to some of you techies that will mean nothing to anyone who's worked in a school that's kind of my uh, crowning glory that which uh, got me a good accommodation from the head uh, obviously this is being recorded and some of you I assume are watching this from the future scary as that may be. I've also thrown up my slides in the bottom left under files so if anyone wants to grab them to have my slides for future reference feel free. Uh, equally if in the uh, deep and darkest future you want to email about anything I say or ask for a copy of anything I've used then feel free. So now I work for Web Anywhere and since here I've taken over a lot of the uh, theme work and I learned a lot about themes through my various jobs and I'm kind of just here to give you an idea of where I've been uh, what mistakes I've made, because there's always some, and I'd rather share them than hide them, and kind of where I'm going in the future. So let's get started. I'll do a bit of a, a background on Moodle themes generally. Uh, I don't like to assume anyone knows anything about the subject, because this is an introductory course. Uh, to begin with, the Moodle theme is actually the thing that controls the look and feel of the Moodle. So uh, obviously sometimes you'll have install the Moodle and just get blank uh, which is the base theme and it will just look all white and kind of quite plain looking and when you look at other Moodles you'll see all the jazzy colours and the pictures and the icon layouts and all of that is the theme 
So themes are very important in Moodle, particularly if you want user engagement, because if something looks kind of plain and boring, you're going to struggle to get students and teachers online. Whereas if something looks a bit more interesting and has a bit of kind of panache to it, then it'll be much easier to get people involved. Now I've thrown up on the screen there a basic anatomy of a Moodle theme. Uh, there's folders and files that control the theme and everything's organised by these folders. Now this is what I'd call a fairly standard theme, there's more things you can do. Uh, one thing I've left off here is something called renderers.php which if some of you are more experienced you'll know about. That controls kind of how the theme uh, do, does things like menus but we'll leave some of the advanced stuff till later. Now in basic structure, I'll start from top left, we've got the lang folder and that contains language strings, whichever languages your theme's in. And that controls things like where the theme pages are named, where the positions are named, when you go to move to a different position, all that sort of thing contained in language. Equally the very important readme, which I believe every theme should have and you should keep a good log in your readme, so uh, that's in there as well. Your layout folder has your general PHP files. Uh, I use general quite specifically there because one of them would almost always be called general.php. Uh, equally it can allow you to have different layouts for different types of pages. You could have login.php and that sort of thing. And what these do is basically define the elements on the page. It's a PHP file but some of it is written in HTML so it's not too scary if you're not used to PHP. You can still have a play with them and get a feel for where things are going. And what I suggest at the start out is open up your layout file and just watch it down the page. And you should start being able to tie up, right, this is this element, uh, and this is where it is on the page. And I'd strongly recommend something like Firebug, uh, which you can install on Firefox or Chrome, as a good way of kind of looking at your code and saying, right, okay, well, this is where this element is and this is what it controls. The next three folders are the Pix folders. Uh, the first one is just Pix, and this contains any of the pictures that you use in your theme. Uh, but it's very important it's named Pix because Pix is one of the protected words in Moodle. So if you use this it's much much easier to reference things and to uh, keep everything working the way it should. Now Pix Core and Pix Plugins are something that I think soon you'll stop seeing in themes because I have heard that Moodle is looking to update its icon set soon. But uh, at the moment, as far as things go, the icons you see around Moodle, like the edit icons and the move icons, a lot of them are relatively basic looking, um, we've had a lot of users say oh, they put them off, they don't look particularly you know, advanced. So what you can do with PixCore and Pix plugins is put other pictures in there using the same folder structure that you get in the core of Moodle and that will be auto applied to replace it. We also have the style folder, this is another good one that does exactly what it says on the tin. The style folder contains all the CSS styles for your theme. Uh, by default you normally have something called core.css in there and possibly an editor.css but obviously like with anything here you can customise it and have as many files as you like. I know some users that prefer to have one big core file with all the core code in, others that want to break it up and have you know menu.css, layout.css, that sort of thing. So it's really entirely up to you how you arrange it but it's just good to know that that's where they are. Now config.php is your bare bones file that you need in every single Moodle theme and it does all the definitions for you. So Moodle looks for this automatically and what config.php does is tell you where the files are. So it will say, you know, here's where style is, here's where layout is, what things like columns we're using, uh, whether it does any inheritance, which we'll look at later, and what the theme's name is as well. So these are all really critical things happening in config.php and it's kind of Without a config, you haven't got a theme, so it's really, really critical to get that right. And I strongly suggest when you're starting out to download one that you know works and play with that one first. The other two files I've left in there are lib.php and settings.php. Now, what these do are control your settings pages. Now, we'll look at settings pages in a bit with a bit more depth, but you need these two. Lib basically contains a lot of your definitions and your uh, default values, and settings controls the actual settings page. So that's a, a bit of a general anatomy in Moodle 2 themes. Now, my initial steps on my journey was learning themes in Moodle 1.9. Now this is a Moodle 1.9 anatomy, you can see it's a little bit different from uh, what you're used to. A lot of it's broadly the same though, you can see the default.css, you can see the pics folder, uh, you can see a readme, 
you can see a styles call and a config so there's still things that are similar in there uh, you'll see a lot more HTML files in there which did change in Moodle 2 uh, it's a lot less organized as you can see it's just files in the folder uh, however you know it, it was where I started the big downside to them is they're not actually compatible with Moodle 2 so don't try to install 1.9 theme on Moodle 2 it's really critical that however all is not lost if you've learnt Moodle 1.9 themes you won't find it that hard to get used to Moodle 2 themes and this is where I started I learnt initially about PHP based menus you can see a menu in there I started learning a bit more about style sheets and all that sort of thing and really kind of cut my teeth on some Moodle 1.9 themes so it's totally not wasted experience if you've got it uh, but equally if you're moving on from kind of now onwards and you want to carry on I'd say your best starting straight with Moodle 2 themes is not kind of a logical progression. Now that leads me to my uh, my next point which is OMG Moodle 2. Uh, for those of you that were in the industry at the time I'm sure quite a few of you had the same problem. Uh, I worked at a school when Moodle 2 was released and within about a week of the press release saying that it was out uh, I had pretty much half the teaching staff and all the senior management banging on my door telling me that we needed Moodle 2, it was the best thing since sliced bread and we had to have it installed by Tuesday. Now as many of you will remember from back then it was quite hard to upgrade to Moodle 2 and keep all your data uh, but the big thing for me was themes because that was my specialty and as you can see when I initially looked at the structure I was completely all over the place. It's very hard to look at the Moodle 2 structure as someone who knows Moodle 1.9 themes quite well and have any clue what you're doing with it. However, as I was having a look, I came up to kind of several kind of key points. Uh, the first one is it is a different structure, but it is similar. It's not totally different. And partly being a more modern piece of software with Moodle 2, you have got more opportunity to use things like CSS3 and HTML5, uh, which is really good. Obviously, that's browser dependent, which we'll talk about in a bit. But it does mean you've got the framework there to do a lot more with what you're doing there is the dock as well which is a new thing in Moodle 2 I'm sure most of you have at least played with the Moodle 2 so far and if you look at the left hand side there is a long thin line where you can hide blocks to and what's really nice with that is it's on a per user setting so individual users can hide blocks they don't want to see up there and you don't have lots of minimized titles left in your page and it means if necessary you can even hide both columns if you want so if you want to have a bigger content area for what you're doing you can do that sort of thing as well there are settings pages. Now I know a few people had experimented with these in Moodle 1.9 but they kind of appeared in a really big way in Moodle 2 and uh, they kind of changed the way we think about things because the nice thing with the setting page is you can change whatever CSS you set up to be able to change without actually having to go in and edit the CSS files. So that's kind of a really really big change. The other thing I saw which is going to be kind of subjective but this is uh, my journey anyway is in the UK at least I was quite used to seeing fixed width themes usually either 800 pixels or 1000 pixels in most of the schools I spoke to um, obviously because of screen sizes changing that's gone up uh, so even if you see a fixed width theme it's more likely to be 1200 pixels but equally schools have been kind of getting more engaged with the idea of fluid themes um, particularly since I moved to Web Anywhere I've seen a lot more schools wanting fluid width themes this is where you set the width of the theme to something like 95% and the theme will then fill 95% of the screen architecture so it means things can display nicely whether it's on a small screen or whether it's on you know, a mammoth big plasma screen on the wall now this does of course present challenges for you as a theme designer because a lot of the kind of the go-to things from the past like fixed little images to control block sizes kind of headers that look very stylish but with a certain width we can't really use it anymore without them looking crazy on really big screens. So in terms of the graphics you use and in terms of the way you design your themes, taking this sort of thing into account is really important. Now the next uh, tip I have, which uh, will sound quite controversial but we are in an open source environment so I wouldn't worry too much, is about ripping off. Now it's very very hard, and trust me I've been there, to open up a, a blank Moodle 2 and go right I'm going to write myself a theme and have any clue where to start and I've spoken to lots of people who now work in themes and doing this is pretty much how everyone starts you take a theme you know works that's quite popular download it and install it and then start making some changes 
and by doing this you get a good way of figuring out how things work what the structure of the theme is how to change things how to make you know sensible changes how to revert changes and all of that and what helps with this is if you get stuck if you use one of these big themes it's really easy to jump on the Moodle forums or to email the creators and just go I'm really stuck you know I need some help is there anything you can do and you know we're quite a good community and I think that's one of the strongest things about Moodle is the community and what I really like is that everyone's really game for this and if you go oh, I was playing with Leatherband the other night I got stuck on this can anyone help you'll get a multitude of answers back to you now the two I've highlighted here Leatherbound is actually a Moodle core now which is really kind of a big endorsement of what kind of theme it is. It's a relatively basic theme, but I think it's good because it keeps all the structure in place, it gives you a few options, it kind of gives you a nice sort of setting, and it was written by Patrick Malley. I hope I've said his name right, Patrick, so I'm very sorry if that was wrong. And he is newschoollearning.com. It doesn't just work for them, he actually is New School Learning. Uh, but as I said, that's in your core files, so as soon as you've downloaded Moodle, you have a copy of Leatherbound. Uh, what's nice as well is it's a 100% width theme and it's really easy to change that to 95% and have a play there as well. And it has all the standard features like the dock and the block positions and all of that. The other one that I'm a big, big fan of, and this is really the one that got me started on really being interested in Moodle 2 themes, is the Aardvark theme. Now my big thanks are to Sean, I think it's Dubony, but I am very sorry if that's wrong Sean, at Newbury College in the UK here who wrote the original theme uh, but equally there's been lots of other contributors like Mary Cooch, the Moodle Fairy for those of you that know her has written a nice version of this called Aardvark Post-it which is kind of a variation on the theme and what I really like about Aardvark is it's really gone to town with some of the more advanced features so it uses settings pages really well uh, you won't be able to see it on the screenshot I've grabbed but if you download it you'll see it quite quickly if you click on the little person picture in the corner which is your profile picture a kind of pop over window appears which shows you a lot of the features to do with your personal so it's got links to your profile things like your calendar being able to change your password and all that sort of thing and it's a pop over window which you don't really see very often in Moodles so it's kind of there's two there leather bound I say is more basic which is a good way of beginning and aardvark's a little bit more advanced which gives you something to kind of aspire to but I think it really is the right way of doing things is to have a play with these themes get a feel for them get a feel for the structure and then you feel really confident as to where you're going. Next up is a concept that I came to on my journey, which is that of a master theme. Now, initially, especially if you work just in a school, you might be going, oh, I don't, I don't need a master theme, I need to write one theme. Uh, believe you me, the time will come when you do think actually a master theme is quite a good idea. Uh, once we uh, we got a Moodle 2 theme developed, and that was really good and everyone liked it, I started getting quite regular requests from other departments to write their own theme. And the problem is with that, that I was equally getting messages from the senior leadership team telling me that we needed a cohesive image on the Moodle and that we shouldn't have this kind of fragmentation of branding that was going on. So obviously trying to equalise the two of them is quite tricky. So we were looking at ways of saving time and production and having it where it's not kind of a big mess of things and the idea occurred to us of using something like a master theme where we have one theme that unifies the school and then we can kind of make variations to various departments now as ever I said at the beginning I'm not going to hide what I did wrong uh, I think the best way of learning be this in school be this in Moodle is to learn from your own and others mistakes and I think it would be uh, very cowardly of me to hide these things that I got wrong when I was beginning and hopefully if some of you are on the same sort of journey then uh, these tips might be kind of helpful to you so I'll kind of go through what my mistakes are for now and then we'll go on to the next few slides and explaining how I repaired them and hopefully those fixes will be useful to you guys as well now the initial one I thought right I need to make myself a master theme I need to write something from scratch really get this right so what I started by doing is copying all the CSS and PHP from the base of theme now, I don't know if many of you have played with the base theme, but there is a hell of a lot of code in there. And a lot of it is redundant for reasons that we'll look at later. But that was my initial thing, and it got me a theme of several thousand lines. Now, 
I had already decided at the beginning that I was going to annotate my theme and make sure my notes were really in order and that the code comments were there and as I started trying to crack through base and comment everything, there are some comments in there already, but trying to comment line by line it was a hellish task to begin with. My next big mistake was as I said at the earlier thing and you'll probably see where I'm going with this is I was trying to install Moodle pictures as a patch. I was aware that you know, every time I had to upgrade Moodle and wipe the core files I'd lose any changes I made there so I was trying to write a patch that would run as kind of a plugin that would write over the Moodle Pix files whenever they were upgraded. This was a very very complicated way of doing it and not one I suggest and as you saw in the anatomy initially they can actually be placed in the theme but we'll hit that in a little bit as to how you do that. I was also trying to hard code banners again this is a classic one my initial idea was one big theme that looks the same for everyone and underneath that put in a second kind of header for each department. Now I hadn't come up with a good way of doing this so what I was doing is using PHP to hard code the banners in there. Now the problem being that it was very hard to get that right and get it formatted correctly and also to put all the styling on it and make sure it was styled properly. Every time they wanted to change the images we were then back into the theme, we were changing it and because it was kind of the only part of the theme they could change it was a right pain to do and they wanted it doing it every two weeks and all that sort of thing. And the other thing I had was action buttons. Uh, action buttons, for those of you that don't know, are the two little buttons in the top right which control whether you can minimize or dock the block. Now we started using blocks, particularly one on the right hand side, for doing school announcements. Some of them were quite critical, things like school closures or snow days, for those of you in this uh, the colder climes of the world. I assume you probably have the uh, equivalent on the hot end of the scale in places like Australia. But these were school closure days and it was really critical to get them out on the Moodle. Now the problem being that when uh, you had these action buttons, because they're user based, a particular user could dock or minimise a block, you then update it and think, well that's great, everyone will see it when they log on to the Moodle. You then find out that three quarters of your users have hidden the block and they can't see the notice. Now this obviously is a pain if parents log in on using their kids accounts and they can't see anything because the kids have hidden it all you know it's not a really good way of going. So that's kind of my first few what I'd call major errors. Uh, next up is the fun bit I get to explain how I fix them so uh, hopefully this bit will be really useful and again don't worry about uh, taking copious notes or anything because obviously this is being recorded and equally my slides are just down here on the left hand side so you can grab them there as well. Now, inheritance, this is the uh, the fix for the problem of copying all the code from the base theme. What Moodle does, which is really, really nice, is lets you inherit from other themes. Now, what this means is when Moodle's rendering and it's loading a page, it'll look in your theme for any appropriate styles, for anything that needs to be done. And if there isn't anything, it'll go back to one of the previous themes. It doesn't quite load that way around, but that's a good way of thinking about it. That if you've missed something, it'll go back to one of the themes you've tagged and it'll pull it from there. Now for my master theme this took the number of lines of code I needed from somewhere around the 3000 mark to about 250 and that was a fully customized theme. So you can really tell quite how quickly it does it. Now this is the line of code I've highlighted for you and this goes in your uh, config.php so I had a slight main brain wipe there. Uh, ignore the colors I've used notepad++ so that's where the colors have come from but it's just the code that's important. Now the way Moodle renders code is it starts with what's called the grandfather of your theme base and that's on the right hand side which for me is base. Now I would always say have base as your grandfather. If you don't inherit anything else that's fine but always have base because what this ensures is if you've missed something instead of failing and rendering really ugly it'll go back to base and render properly. And the way Moodle loads it is it loads base first and applies all that CSS then it applies any other inherited themes, like we've got a canvas here and then finally it applies your theme and because CSS cascades the last thing to be applied takes precedence. Now obviously it doesn't render the whole page then render it again and then render it again that would be really slow but it does it kind of in the blink of an eye. And yes Justin I uh, love Notepad++ as much as you do don't worry, it keeps me entertained. Uh, it's always nice when it gives you a big glowing red error when you file up your code. Uh, now canvas and base I'd say is a fairly standard setup what you can do is inherit for more themes or other themes, like if you made changes to leather bound, perhaps you want to do base, then leather bound, then your theme. 
uh, but it's just important to remember it goes from right to left. You would believe the problems I had initially when I put base, comma, canvas, thinking, well, that's logical, you know, work in English from left to right. I'll go base then canvas, and I caused all sorts of bother, loads of errors, loads of problems occurring that shouldn't have been doing. So you need to make sure you get your grandfather, your father, and then your theme, or grandmother and mother, if you prefer. Now, the next up was the uh, the problem of banners and having to update them all the time and having the departments bleat on at me that their banner was out of date and when, trust me when you get that happening from 25 different departments all at the same time it does leave a little bit of uh, a time deficiency on your part and this is one of the themes we've played with at Web Anywhere this is just for a, uh, a pretend high school the Web Anywhere high school which I'm sure you can uh, understand isn't real and what we've done here is add in positions and this is something I'm really pleased with so you can see on the left arrows highlighting one of them and on the right are the standard Moodle positions and these are columns so you can stack up lots of blocks in them and you can pick to go left or right now what we've done in this theme is added extra positions around that so there's a banner position across the top which is set to width 100% there's three more columns underneath that which are set to 33% respectively and what this means is you can get a nice grid going on with the columns and a couple of banners across the top. Now what you can't see in this screenshot is we've actually replicated that structure underneath as well for the footer. So you've got a banner footer and then three columns of footers. So you can imagine the application straight away. You can put banners up for your snow days. Your footers can contain all your compliance logos and things like investors in people, your latest Ofsted results, anything like that. And you've got a really nice structure to your site already. And what's nice is I tend to use HTML blocks to do these because they're nice and flexible. And it means that you can edit them, you can get your users to edit them, you can train anyone to edit a HTML block. It's not hard, especially with a WYSIWYG editor. So that's really nice at getting the functionality there. And then the onus isn't on you as the IT team to update every single banner. If a user wants to update their own banner, they have access, they can just do it. Now what's nice as well is because it's a block position, if you find any nice blocks online, like something to track individual learner paths, something to give direct links into various parts of the Moodle, you can put them up there as well. So because they're standard block positions, you can put wherever you like up there that's a block, which makes it really functional and really nice and easy to use. There is a fair bit of code behind doing this. Uh, it starts with some if statements in PHP. Uh, what I strongly recommend is doing what I did when I wanted to learn how to do this and jumping on Moodle.org. There are plenty of tutorials. Uh, if anyone wants me to go and dig one out for them and send it to them, just let me know. Uh, drop me an email or a tweet afterwards and I'll find one for you. Uh, but there's a lot of them have got tutorials with kind of sample code to download where you can download, have a play, have a test yourself and see how it goes. Now, next up is position styling. Now, this problem actually came up initially with my action button problem, uh, but it's something I found can be applied in quite a lot of different ways, which is really good. Now, once you've set up all your positions and you've named them, you can actually format each position differently. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this in CSS, but it was something that was uh, initially new to me because I didn't realize positions were named. And what you can do is use the hashtag, much like Twitter, to uh, tag them straight into the course files as well. Uh, just to answer Stephen, yep, I'll try to find out the uh, tutorials and I'll throw them onto the course there. Uh, now what you can do here is the side pre-position is kind of the standard Moodle terms for the left hand side. Side post is the standard Moodle term for the right hand side. So obviously you can change them but that's kind of standard, so you'll see them a lot. Uh, I've used banner one as my header position so that's another example for you there and what you can do then is you can see in this theme I've written underneath we've got a nice gradiated background from left to right yellow to red and then I've said side pre make all my borders red yellow rather and side post make them all red and what's really nice is that you don't have to change it per block or worry about when you move a block if I move the login block over to the left it will become yellow if I move the main menu over to the right, it will become red. It's really, really easy to get this working. It's not kind of a, a hard concept to grasp. Uh, and all you need to do is use these hashtags to tag various parts of the Moodle. And this applies to a lot of parts of Moodle, but particularly I found blocks are a really nice way of using it. 
Now one of the few bits of code I've thrown up today, because I think it's really useful and really really easy fix, is hiding the action buttons for a position. So here my position is called banner, and then hash banner, then a space, and then dot block action is the uh, the class that we're trying to deal with, and that contains the two action buttons you can see on the menus there, the negative sign to minimize the, the block, and the uh, doc symbol as well. Just set them to display to none, and then close your tag. And what's really nice about that is that you can uh, have the banners hidden of all the action buttons. Users don't have to worry about hiding things. You know as an admin that everyone will see the message because no one can dock it, no one can hide it. And it's just a really, really nice way for certain types of blocks to hide the action buttons because they're not always needed. Uh, what it doesn't affect is the editing buttons, so if you turn on editing status you can sort of edit everything as normal. All it's doing is hiring, hiding the user action buttons in the middle. I'm assuming that's a, a good link to the form there Richard, so thank you for that. I'd advise everyone to uh, get clicking away on the form as well. Now the settings pages I mentioned briefly earlier, I'll go into a little bit more depth now. Uh, Again, it's not something I'm going to present all the code for right now because it'll be make for quite a boring talk. But if you do want the code, as I've said before, there is the Moodle.org website and there's also the forums. Equally, feel free to email or tweet me. And as Stephen asked, I'm going to try to put up some uh, links to tutorials on the course for this uh, session. Now, the ability to change CSS from Moodle itself is kind of critical. Uh, back in uh, what I refer to as kind of ye old days. I uh, often dealt with hosted Moodles where we didn't host it internally in the school, they were hosted off site. And what it meant is every time you made a change to the theme, you had to FTP up your theme. And trust me, we had a, a very, very awful internet connection. Once you'd FTP up the theme, you then had to reload the Moodle, get it all running again, and then test your fix. Now, obviously, if you've made a change and it hasn't worked, you then have to go through the whole process again which you know can add up to quite a lot of time something really quick like changing a colour on a menu might take you all day of re-uploading the theme, re-uploading the theme making the changes again, redoing it again you know and you start to waste quite a lot of time now what the second page has let you do is actually change various CSS settings from within the theme so there's a certain string that you'll learn when you do these that says setting colon whatever the name of the setting is, so setting code on background colour. Once you set these up, you can set the default. So the default on this theme for the background colour is white, which is you know, six Fs. And then you change it within the settings page and hit save. And then when it renders the page, it reads that instead of what's written in the CSS file and runs that instead. Now there's a few different types you can use. There's the colour picker, which you can see a few examples of there, which is a really nice way of just selecting colours. And anytime you click on a colour, it shows the uh, hex code underneath which is a really nice way of doing it there's a text area which is the one you can see at the top of that page which is my page width setting so it's just kind of a single line of text to put in a few characters a text box which is kind of the same but it's a bigger box and what I find this really useful for is a general add CSS at the end box so you can put the same white right at the end on its own and say here's where you add in some extra CSS and then just throw things into the box you also have an example you can't see on this page, which is a drop down, and what that does is let you select from a predefined list. Now, the way I tend to use that is to select from a predefined list of style sheets to load, and what it means is you can have a, a theme with different seasons on it, or different colour schemes, or anything like that. So it means it is not a case of one size fits all, you can have a selectable group, but it's not quite as flexible as letting them have colour pickers, which may be what you want because if you've got kind of a cohesive school image you may want to have it where you know people can pick to change it from spring to summer to winter but they can't pick to change it from you know red to pink because they fancy it now the two files you need to do all of this are lib.php and settings.php and you need to put in extra language strings as well as I said I'll, I'll drop in some tutorials for everyone but basically lib sets up the structure of your settings and lets you set all the defaults and gets everything configured that way. Settings.php is actually setting up this settings page. So it says what type of things to show. You know, show a colour picker, show a text box, and where the settings are going, which is back into the lib. 
Now I know it's only a brief overview, uh, but it is something I find really, really useful. So I strongly suggest people start having a play and download some themes that have got settings pages. I think there's a couple already in Corb anyway, and then kind of see where you go from there. Now, this is the bit where I'm starting to go into kind of future stuff, which I always find quite exciting. And I'd quite like to do is share with you guys kind of stuff I'm looking at from now onwards, because obviously I've been doing this for a while now, uh, and you've seen kind of some of my many mistakes. So uh, what I want to do now is share a little bit of kind of my sort of vision for the future, and uh, the sort of things I'm researching and looking at regularly now. Now, inheritance we've already touched upon, and what it's occurred to me is what about doing a more advanced form of inheritance. So instead of rewriting a master theme every time you want to make changes, why not inherit the master theme? So have your master theme set up, have that all configured normally. Then in your config, have master theme, canvas, base, make sure you get the order right. Then when you want to change things, you should be able to write new themes in somewhere between 10 and 50 lines of CSS, not several hundred. So a lot of your additional themes will literally be a pix folder with some pictures in, a layout and a CSS folder. They've got a few lines of code in just to define, go here. You can actually even skip the layout page if you're not making any changes to the layout as well. So there's some real good functionality you can do there where you can maintain one code base. So you have one master theme that you maintain, you take care of, you know how it's working. And then for each individual department within that, you just have very, very small themes that are very quick to load, which just change you know, which pictures it's calling, which colors it's calling by default, and that sort of thing. So this is something I'm really excited about, and it's something I think will be you know, really important moving forward. Now on top of that, there is the future. Now as of June the 18th, which is a predicted release date for Moodle 2.3, Moodle will no longer support IE7 and uh, in about a year's time or so I'm foreseeing kind of the death of IE8. Now a lot of people have a fondness for uh, XP, myself included, but I have found particularly working in schools that having to recode everything to work in things like IE8 is a real pain. You know, it is something that causes a lot of problems. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't bother, obviously if your school uses IE it's imperative that you get everything working on IE but you do lose out on a lot of nice features things like CSS3 and HTML5 just don't run properly in IE8 uh, the newer version of IE are beginning to support more IE9 does a little bit, IE10 does a lot more so there's definite improvements to be had there uh, there's likely to be schools moving up to Vista and 7 so that's really good now the other thing is, uh, as Rich has highlighted as well a lot of schools won't be getting rid of XP for quite a long time so I have an alternative suggestion uh, you may have spotted on the first slide that WebAnywhere is a Google partner as well as a Moodle partner and what Google have released, I have to say without much fanfare, which is unusual for them, is something called Chrome for Business and what we've been looking at is Chrome for Business in schools and one of the criticisms schools often have of kind of the open source environment and especially when it comes to browsers it's all very well changing but then lots of school lots of students are quite clever with these things they can make their own changes they might be able to break your proxy settings and get around those whereas with IE you can lock it down using Active Directory's group policies get it all tied in now what Chrome for Business is is a version of Chrome that comes with group policy plugins now what that means is you can plug into your group policy all the sorts of settings you edit in IE for Chrome instead uh, and kind of in an effort to uh, not sound hypocritical is actually what we use in this business ourselves. We have Chrome pre installed on the computers and it's locked down using group policy. So you know it's a really nice way and uh, I work on XP machine myself as a lot of my colleagues but we've got fully controlled Chrome installations that you're working with a team of web developers and we've not found it very easy to hack around it when we need to so I'm fairly certain that students won't. Uh, but it is just another thing especially if you work in a school it's another thing you could present to your leadership and say right okay we can't upgrade from XP that's too expensive but Chrome is free so can we install Chrome for Business which would give us the same functionality so it's just another way of kind of hitting the problem rather than just waiting for IE to die out now the other thing that I'll admit straight away I've only just been looking at I've not really got to grips with it yet but I think it's really exciting is running themes like normal plugins now what you can do then is have upgrade codes and required versions 
exactly like you can do with normal blocks. Now most of you will have installed blocks or other plugins and you'll see you know, the upgrade scripts running, you'll see the required versions coming up. Now what they've actually put in Moodle 2 is the ability to do that for themes as well, which you didn't used to be able to do. Now I think this is really, really exciting. It uh, will stop a lot of the problems I've had with things. If people have installed something into the wrong version, it's broken something. You can have the upgrade scripts running to you know, clear out settings pages, clear out database if you need to, all that sort of thing. Uh, and I admit I don't know a lot about this yet. I've thrown in the links to Moodle Docs, which I've been reading in my spare time to try to figure this out. Uh, but it is something I think over the next six months you'll start to see a lot more of when you install themes. They'll come up as normal plugins. And I think that's really, really good. Uh, the other thing which I know uh, Sean and Mary have started with the Aardvark theme, but I think we'll see a lot more about, of is more fluid positions. Uh, you can see it a bit on the iMoot site with the live chat. I'm sure some of you have seen that pops up in the bottom right. And I think what I'd love to be able to do is write a position that does that that you can throw blocks into. A bit like a user can throw a box into the dock, I'd quite like to have a pop out from the left or a pop out from the right that Isaac can throw a block into that actually slides out. Now this is kind of very advanced, I've not actually figured out how to do this yet, but what's nice with the framework of themes in Moodle 2 is it is really, really flexible. Uh, just to answer Richard's questions, yeah, they can be, but you don't have to set them that way. So themes have got this, and it is a capability, uh, but a lot of people are still writing themes like I do without using version.php and upgrade.php to control the upgrade versions. So it's still kind of optional at the moment, but it's something that I think will become much more critical as time goes on. Uh, but as I was saying on positions, what I'd really love to see is more flexible positions, uh, more things that pop outs, pop overs, pop unders, that sort of thing. Uh, and I think it's kind of something that will really get to the point where you can have more Moodle themes that don't look moodly, uh, which is kind of a strange thing to say, but one of the criticisms that's often levelled at Moodles I've worked with is teachers go, oh yeah, but they all look the same, don't they? You know, it's all kind of three columns, a bit of a header at the top, a bit of a background, but you know, you can always tell it's a Moodle. And what I've begun to see a little more of, when you certainly look around the net and look around the kind of the registered sites on Moodle.org, is more and more sites now going where they look more like something else. You know, maybe look like a WordPress or look like a Joomla site or something like that and they just look a bit different. And that to me is really exciting. I think it's something that uh, is kind of new to us and a lot of us are taking a while to get around that and kind of think, right, we're going to think in a slightly different way as to how we do that. Uh, but I think the more we can work on and the more we can get it where themes kind of can sometimes look like a Moodle and sometimes look completely different and be a different sort of thing. I think that would be really good. Now I'm kind of coming up to the uh, the end of the uh, formal part of the presentation here. Uh, there will be a Q&A session for about 15 minutes or so as there are on all of these presentations. You're welcome to stay for that. Uh, it's been a quite a long and complicated journey for myself going through Moodle themes. Uh, I've learned a lot as time goes on. I've made quite a few mistakes which I've uh, tried to highlight some of the bigger ones to you. So I hope that's been of some help to people. Uh, particularly if you're kind of at the starting end of the theme journey. Hopefully that's given you a bit of a hint and tip of what to avoid and what things to kind of dodge out of. Uh, if you need to get hold of me afterwards, best bet is Twitter. I put my Twitter address up there again for you now. It's at School Anywhere, which is our brand for Moodle products. So if you want to tweet me at all, either just to say hi and uh, give me some feedback or to just say, ask a question or ask for a link, that's more than fine. So I'm going to roll us into the... Uh, Q&A mode on Adobe Connect now. Uh, you're welcome to either kind of throw up questions into the chat and I'll try to answer or uh, if you do need to uh, use your microphone instead if you use the hands up symbol I can enable someone's microphone for them. So I hope you've enjoyed that and uh, kind of fire away. No one got any questions at the moment then? Have we covered everything? Or have I just muted my mic?
I think it's to answer uh, Stefan's question there about how long it will take him to learn HTML and CSS to apply corporate design to his Moodle, I think not very long at all to be honest. Uh, if you just want kind of the basics and you want to kind of apply a banner image and change the colours, I think you should need a little bit of CSS. As I said, grab one of the uh, grab one of the existing themes as Richard's advising as well. It's kind of the uh, the focus of my ripping off slide. Grab one of the uh, ones that you think kind of works close to you, throw in a local host, update some of the pictures and that sort of thing. Uh, equally, as we've said kind of all the way through, if you do get stuck, you know, email me, email other people, you know, uh, jump up on uh, Moodle.org and jump on the forums and kind of ask for help there. It's really the nice thing with Moodle is you've got a lot of resources available to you to kind of give you a hand. I mean, from the sounds of what you've uh, been changing, Stephen, uh, Stephen, sorry, I think you've uh, been doing a fair bit of what I'd advise is kind of the uh, the beginning part, which is really good. Yeah, Justin, I've been looking at single column themes as well. Uh, you can do them. The bit I've struggled with a little bit is uh, they seem to reappear when you try to add a new block, and I uh, I know even Martin himself. Uh, Martin Dougie Armas has struggled a bit with this if you saw some of his keynote uh, but yeah you can actually do anything you like uh, I'd always advise having one extra column left even if you don't use it just in case something is hard coded to appear uh, the one I tend to leave if I have to is side pre uh, I have seen not to uh, discourage people's work but what I'd call slightly badly written blocks that have kind of been hard coded to uh, render into side pre uh, the other thing to look at is something like, as we were saying about having the different positions, so the ones at the top and the ones at the bottom. Uh, yeah, as Richard Sarlat, Mary, uh, the Moodle fairy, has done something similar as well. Put something underneath and make that side pre, so that if it is hard coded, you've got a side pre and maybe a side post as well that you can do. Yeah, Mary Evans, the Moodle fairy. Uh, Justin, to answer your question, I'd say the two I've advised so far are good places to start. Uh, oh, is it Mary Evans, not Mary Cooch? My apologies, Richard, sorry, getting confused with the Marys. Uh, yeah, I'd say Leatherbound's a good one, it's in core, so you'll have it pre installed if you install Lughurst anyway. And uh, the other one is Aardvark. There's a few ver versions of Aardvark, I posted up kind of the original. Uh, Mary Cooch, to get the right Mary, has written a Aardvark post-it, which is a variation which is a bit more fluid. Uh, 